Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Village Torah, where we will discuss this week's Torah portion uh, with me, your host, Rabbi Drew. And this week's Torah portion is Nitzavim. We are getting towards the end of, of the Torah, the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And we have, well, you know, it's, it's Moses. So Moses is talking about just sort of closing things up, wrapping things up as he's about to wrap up the entirety of the book of Deuteronomy. I actually want to focus here on a particular phrase that he uses in this week's Torah portion. The phrase that I want to focus on is found here within these several verses here in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. Surely this instruction, which I enjoin upon you this day, is not too baffling for you, nor is it beyond reach. It is not in the heavens that you should say, who among us can go up to the heavens and get it for us and impart it to us that we may observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who among us can cross to the other side of the sea and get it for us and part it to us that we may observe it. Nope. The thing is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to observe it. We are talking here. Overall, we're talking about Torah, the commandments, observance, and really Moses is saying it is not obscure. It is not super duper far away. It is not crazy. Now, the particular line that I want to focus on, of course, we we talk here in verse 13 about the sea. So it's sort of a, a horizontal distance away. It is super far away. We can't just walk over and get it. And verse 12, we have it is not in the heavens. Lo he that it is not super duper vertically far away, that it is otherwise inaccessible. So no matter how one slices it, whether it's a horizontal, horizontal, super duper far distance inaccessibility or a super vertically far away thing up in the heavens for us to, that it's inaccessible for us. Moses is saying, that's not okay. That's not a legitimate excuse to say, it's just impossibly far away. We cannot attain it. We cannot reach it. He says, it's something actually that is quite close. Doing uh, ultimately here in the fourth verse, that verse 14, ki karove lecha hadavar ma'od. This is incredibly close. It's very accessible to us. So certainly, of course, it's we're getting close to the holiday season, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. We have a lot of holidays. It's certainly a time of thinking about all these celebrations, but also the Torah are sort of the, the lifeblood of the Jewish people. What what are we to do? And we have our, our sort of our foundational document here, the Torah, that Moses is saying, it's not obscure. It's not hard to, it's not abstruse. It's not super duper complicatedly far away. It's here. It's immediately accessible to all of us. I'm really curious about this phrase, lo bashamaymi. It's not in the heavens. What we, uh, so I wanted to share with you several several statements of the rabbis in the Talmud using this phrase. Now, I want to first focus on, uh, I really want to talk about two entirely different ways of talking about it. So I will just as a sort of a tease, talk about the second one later, which occurs in a really fascinating story, perhaps one of the most famous, one of the, yeah, one of the most famous Talmudic stories in the entire Talmud. But before we get there, a few different fourth century, fourth and third century rabbis discussing how they they want to use this term. The first of these three rabbis, the this lineup of rabbis, and they're dealing with this first is Rabbi Yochanan. He is a, a kind of an early mid third century rabbi, definitely one of the most frequently occurring rabbis in the entirety of the Talmud. So Rabbi Yochanan. So here's what he has to say. He says it is not in heaven. It means that the Torah is not to be found amongst the haughty. And then, nor is it beyond the sea. It is not to be found among merchants or traders. So when he says it's not to be found amongst the haughty, I think what he means here is to say that those who who sort of lift themselves up, that they have they feel themselves of such high stature, it you don't it it's interesting that it you don't need to to be that. It also, I'm not sure that uh it's funny because I think it could be read two different ways. The I think the more immediate understanding is you don't need to be amongst those whom are haughty and or for the, the merchants or the traders, you don't need to be amongst them. But I think he also may have a little bit of a um 
not necessarily fence, a little bit of a, a sharp, sharp attitude towards mm-hmm. those who who prop themselves up with ego and feel themselves to be so self-important. He says they're not going to have so much Torah. I think he's also saying about amongst the merchants and the traders. Yeah, they're not going to have so much Torah either. That, that that's not really uh, uh you're not really going to find it amongst those people. Okay. So a little bit of a offensive remarks, maybe against those uh, two different categories, but certainly they're not the people who are necessarily uh, possessing or otherwise sharing much uh, when it comes to Torah. A little bit later towards the turn of that century, as we shift into the fourth century. So end of the third century and shifting into the fourth century, we have of Dimi Bar Chama Bar Dosa. Okay. So of Dimi, the son of Chama, Son of Dosa, he says, "What does this mean?" Lo he is. It is not in heaven. Indicates that if it were in heaven, you would have to ascend after it, and if it were beyond the sea, you would have to cross after it over the sea. Okay, I think this is actually perhaps the most straightforward explanation of this verse. Simply that when Moses is saying this, oh, you think it's super duper far away horizontally? It's super duper far away vertically. It actually is not. Rather, it's quite accessible. So this is a very, very incredibly straightforward interpretation of this. Now we get to Rava. He is in the early fourth century. He is one of the, he's certainly the leader of his rabbinic generation, Rava, as well as being uh, one of the most influential rabbis in the entirety of the Talmud. And he says, what is this? Lobo Shemaim? He it means that Torah is not to be found in someone who raises his mind over it like the heavens. Now, already as we begin this statement of Rava's, he clearly is channeling and influenced by Rabbi Yochanan's earlier statement that this is not necessarily about finding or the difficulty or the distance in finding the Torah, but actually amongst the people, right? Rabbi Yochanan talked about certain types of people amongst whom you would not find Torah wisdom, knowledge, insight, he is now going further into this concept. And he says, okay, not to be found in someone who raises his mind over it like the heavens, which is actually quite similar to what Rabbi Yochanan said about those who are haughty, right? They they elevate themselves up. Nor is it to be found in someone who expands his mind over it like the sea, that he thinks he knows everything there is to know about the topic he has learned. So this is interesting of different uh, temperaments of types of people who think that they already know so much, right? Uh, That you uh, basically, I I also wonder here, it's clear with Rabbi Yochanan, what we first encountered. It's clear he's talking about different types of people. They're not going to have so much Torah wisdom, insights, or more. Here, it seems similar to Rabbi Yochanan saying these are the types of people in whom Torah is not to be found, but he is actually, Rava seems to be here more, more uh, broadening it quite extensively, saying someone who raises their mind over it, they think they're above the Torah, right? And does not need to be a teacher. So probably someone who actually has a fair amount of, uh, unlike, unlike Rabbi Yochanan, who said these are types of people who don't know, he's saying, no, no, no. These are even types of people who do study the Torah and do have a lot, but someone who thinks they are above the Torah and does not need to be a teacher. They have it for themselves. They don't need to teach. And now someone who, and the other one, expands his mind, that they think, well, uh, I think I just know so much about it. Uh, I don't really need to. I think I already know about everything. So there's not an, um, I don't, maybe a lack of humility, I guess one could say. So interesting, interesting perspectives here from these three rabbis in the third and fourth centuries as sort of certainly for Rabbi Yochanan and Rava, they are talking about temperaments of people, types of people that really not the best attitudes towards these things. And then of Dimi Bar, oh, what is the name of Dimi Bar Chama Bar Dosa. So, okay. That's actually a really straight, in my opinion, a very straightforward explanation of it. Okay, very clear. But it is, of course, fascinating to have those insights from both Rabbi Yochanan and Rava. So now we're going to switch. We're going to transition. These are nice explanations of the verses. Okay, very lovely. But I think uh, this this phrase, 
in subsequent, certainly Talmudic and subsequent explanation and discussion and discourse really gets reframed through the way that it is found in the following story. So here we go. This is a, uh, this story basically takes place at the end of the first century of the common era. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer answered all possible possible answers in the world to support his opinion, but the rabbis did not accept his explanations from him. Now, the context of this has to do with something that is rather obscure to us, and this is known as the Tenur Shel Achnai, the snake-like or serpent-like oven, and the parameters of the conversation concern the impurity. Does this type of oven, does it accept purity? Does it, uh, or, or does it not? And really surrounding this conversation. Now, Rebbe Eliezer here in this, again, somewhat obscure conversation, he says that it does not, whereas the rabbis disagree, they're, all the other rabbis say, no, 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 it does, which is fascinating. Rabbi Eliezer tends to be a little bit in general on the strict side, but here is a particular case in which he turns out to be a little bit more on the lenient side. So he here is saying, uh, I'm answering all possible questions against uh, supporting, advocating for his opinion on this matter. And all the rabbis are saying no, but they're not happy with any of his responses. So now the story continues. So he ultimately said to them, because they, they didn't want to accept his his uh, all his logic, his reasons, his suggestions. So he said to them, if the halakha, if the Jewish way, if the ultimate decision is in accordance with me, then this carob tree will prove it. I'm, I'm now, instead of arguing with logic, people to people, he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this carob tree. This carob tree will prove it for me. So now he's demonstrating proof from nature. So then the carob tree was uprooted from its place, 100 cubits, and some say 400 cubits. Either way, it this carob tree got uprooted and went a far distance away. Okay, that would seem, that's pretty miraculous. That's amazing. Yet the rabbi said to him, one does not cite halachic proof from the carob tree. We're not, that's not convincing for us. So Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if the halacha is in accordance with my opinion, the stream will prove it. The water in the stream turned backward and began flowing in the opposite direction. Again, this is a pretty miraculous occurrence in nature. This does not typically happen or ever happen. And yet it does to seemingly support Rabbi Eliezer's opinion here. They said to him, one does not cite halachic proof from a stream. This is amazing. This is wondrous. This is miraculous. But that's not part of our conversation. That doesn't have anything to do with with the particular rulings around the impurity of this particular oven. Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if the halacha is in accordance with my opinion, then the, the walls of the study hall will prove it. The walls of the study, study hall leaned and began to fall. Rabbi Yehoshua, so now Rabbi Yehoshua and Rabbi Eliezer fre- were colleagues, were contemporaries, and they frequently uh, disagree with each other, clearly. He is disagreeing again with Rabbi Eliezer here. Rabbi Yehoshua scolded the walls and said to them, if Torah scholars are contending with each other in matters of halacha, what is the nature of your involvement? Get out of here. You you, you don't belong to be getting in the middle of this disagreement, this argument. So apparently the walls did not fall out of deference due to Rabbi Yehoshua, but they did not straighten because of the deference due to Rabbi Eliezer. And they remained standing in a in a leaning fashion and diagonal. I'm, of course, it's an incredibly amusing visual that we have about that they they're kind of like the leaning tower of Pisa, right? That they're that they are maintaining this. Um, I don't want to say neutral, but a compromised position. They they of course want to fall entirely because of Rabbi Eliezer's position, but due to the the um, the honor, the deference. For Rabbi Yehoshua, they don't. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if if the halacha is in accordance with my opinion, heaven will prove it. You're not, you don't, you don't trust the trees, the rivers, the walls. They're all falling. They're all changing because of, I know that I'm right. And even nature knows how right I am. It's you who, who are just wrong. You have the wrong opinion in this matter. 
a divine voice emerged from heaven and said, Why are you differing with Rebbe Eliezer, as the halakha is in accordance with his opinion in every place? Even heaven expresses it. It comes out of heaven. Heaven's saying, He's right. Why don't you just listen to him? Rebbe Yehoshua, again I mentioned, he is the contemporary of Rebbe Eliezer. He's also the one for whom the walls did not entirely fall out of deference to Rebbe Yehoshua. And he stood on his feet and he said, Lo Bashamayim he. It's not in heaven. Directly out of our Torah portion, it's not in heaven. Torah is not in heaven. Now this is uh, quite fascinating. This expression of it is not in heaven. Okay. So yes, Torah emanates originally from heaven, comes from God. It's important. But at the same time, I think the rabbis, and it was also incredibly helpful to understand the timing. When do Rabbi Eliezer, when do Rabbi Yehoshua live? When is this taking place? They grew up during the times of the temple. The Beit HaMikdash, the, the sanctification house, still stood when they grew up. However, this story takes place after the destruction of the temple. This is late first century of the common era. The temple no longer stands. There's a different relationship with where we get, where the rabbis get their knowledge, where they make their decision-making processes. We can't just rely on, that's not a, a, here's a fancy word. It's not a legitimate epistemological strategy. We don't, that's not where we get our information from anymore. We have to duke this out in a logical fashion. It's not in heavens. It's amongst us. You can, and so, you know, if I were to, to further develop this for Rebbe Hoshua, Rebbe Eliezer, you are incredibly smart. You are incredibly knowledgeable. And yes, I know you want to appeal to trees, to streams. You want to appeal to nature and nature backs you up on all these matters. But here's the thing. You lost. <laughs> this is all these conversations, all these discussions. The realm of logic remains, resides within us as people. We, we, argue these things out. This is how things are determined through the people, not through through our rabbinic knowledge, our wisdom, our authority, but not through appeals to nature. That's not how things work anymore. And I think this is, of course, it's an incredibly fascinating story. And there's also, I didn't go into it for our sake, but the story continues in the Talmud and there's a fascinating fallout and, and what ultimately happens uh, to the rest of the story. But for our purposes, I want to point out that, of course, that's that's a conversation for another time. It's certainly an interesting story, a lot to be learned from it. But for our purposes, for thinking about Loba Shemayim, he, this is certainly, this story is not just a fantastical story. It's not just something interesting where we see this conflict come up between these rabbis, but also it is interesting in the sense of how self-aware how self-conscious the rabbis are in thinking about how we navigate halakha, how we navigate Jewish practice. That, yes, we have the foundations from the Torah, all these things from God, and yet, certainly after the destruction of the temple, we no longer can use God as a way that we derive information. We have to figure this out on our own. We're, we're up to our own. The temple's lays in ruins. We don't have prophecy anymore. We have to figure it out entirely into ourselves. So certainly an interesting move here by the rabbis. Rabbi Yehoshua ultimately wins, even though Rabbi Eliezer has, is one of the most frequently appearing rabbis of, of his opinions in the Mishnah and the Tosefta and frequently throughout the Talmuds. Here he is put in his place essentially by his rabbinic colleague and others. So certainly an interesting a way to use this phrase lo he it's not simply as we saw with the later rabbis of the third and the fourth centuries which seems to be a fascinating take on it's not super far away don't think it's so super far away that it's not immediately it's not uh, accessible to us there is an accessibility to torah there is an accessibility to jewish life and that's what rabbi yehoshu here is arguing that we have this that we don't need to make appeals to heaven. We don't need to make appeals to something far away. We we discuss this and we debate this and we decide it on our own. That was great. It really was. Thank you. I enjoyed this. Thank you very much. My pleasure.
That was just cool. <laughs> ah, it is. It's, it's so cool. Thank mm. you very much. Your explanation was great. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. And before we go, I just want to acknowledge that all Jewish life and programming here at Majestic Care Cedar Village are due to the support of Jewish Home of Cincinnati. Thank you so much. With that, I want to say thank you so much and Shabbat Shalom.